morning to uh, Catholic Pacific College. It's nice to see a few new faces. Uh, this is the CPC3 lectures, and for the CPC3, we are engaging with tradition, uh, the times, and theology. And part of our, our mission as a school is to cultivate wonder and to inspire uh, the life of the mind. And, uh, and this, we're very happy today to bring in somebody who's never spoken here before, Dr. Carly Henderson. Um, I tell you a little story. Um, Dr. Carly Henderson is married to Dr. David Henderson, and uh, who we hired recently, and this is, he's in his first semester. And, and you know, we, we husbands like to say that the real sort of shining star is not ourselves, but our wives. And this is certainly the case with Dr. David Henderson, because we really hired him because his wife has a PhD in theology, right? Uh, but, but we like you too, David. Um, so it gives me a great pleasure to welcome Dr. Carly Henderson. She has a PhD from the John Paul, the John Paul II Institute for Family, uh, and it's right, family and studies marriage. And marriage. Family right. studies and marriage. Family, no, how's Studies it and marriage and family. Studies and marriage and family, there we go. Um, and um, she's published in a number of articles, but most uh, importantly probably would be her recent article in Communio, which is uh, quite a, a feat. It's a great place to publish. So if you'd like uh, uh, to read further, uh, pick up, uh, it was the winter edition of the recent winter, or spring? Spring 2021. Spring 2021. I'm getting it all wrong. I don't know. Um, well, okay. <laughs> but, uh, so if, it, but look on Communio and you can, you can find uh, this there. So please welcome Dr. Carly Anderson. Thank you so much, Dr. Kaitler, and for having me here tonight. It's nice to see some of you who I've seen at Daily Mass and some new faces. Um, usually, if I'm here at Daily Mass, my children are either clapping when Mass is over, yay, kind of inappropriately, or um, crawling everywhere. So um, anyway, it's nice to be here with you. Um, so even for cradle Catholics, the topic of Mary's mediation can be um, a complicated one. What do we mean when we say Mary mediates grace? It's something that Catholics can take for granted and even be apologetic about sometimes to non-Catholics. I've had many conversations in my life where I said, I promise Mary is not God <laughs> when we say this, but she has a special role. But when it comes to naming what this special role is, sometimes it's a little hard to say, articulate. Um, we'll say she's our mother, she intercedes for us, etc. We might use titles like mother of faith, model of the church, queen of all saints. But what is at the heart of all these titles and the role that she plays in our lives? So the question we're going to address together tonight is what is really at the heart of Mary's role in salvation? This is the question at stake in Mary's mediation. That is, her particular mediation within the mystery of Christ. Her mediation can be seen as kind of distracting from the centrality of Christ, or at best, maybe unnecessary or superfluous, kind of a nice little fun addition that Catholics have to the faith. Um, on the other side, there can be a tendency to overemphasize Mary's role. So we're still left with the question then, what do we mean when we say Mary mediates? So we are going to try to answer this question together tonight with the help of St. John Paul II. As we'll see, it isn't so much that the question of Mary's mediation is particularly complicated. Um, it's more that in a modern and postmodern context in which we find ourselves, mediation itself has become difficult for us to understand as Catholics and Protestants alike. In response to this modern context, John Paul II proposes approaching her mediation by describing it as maternal. In fact, he spoke more of the maternal nature of her mediation, much more than he ever spoke of her as mediatrix, which is a common title that we will find um, in the 20th century especially. So to understand what John Paul II means by Mary's maternal mediation, we need to first trace out how, in general, Mary's mediation has been understood throughout the tradition and then how it really came to a breaking point in the 20th century. John Paul II, in, in effect, offers a development in how we are to understand Mary's mediation. Um, 
precisely in qualifying it as maternal. Maternal is very rich in meaning for him, as we will see. Um, so when he describes it as maternal, he's essentially saying we have to understand Mary's mediation in personalistic terms. And by that, I mean in terms of a gift of self, a participation within communion, and this fundamentally changes not only how we are to understand Mary's mediation, but also the mediation of Christ and our own particular vocations as Christians in the church. Now, to begin this historical account of her mediation, I think it's first helpful to see you know, more concretely what's at stake in this question. And I think the, great, the best place to start is actually with someone who fundamentally disagrees with Mary's mediation, and that's the great Protestant theologian Karl Barth. He writes in his church dogmatics, and I'm quoting here, in the doctrine and worship of Mary, there is disclosed the one heresy of the Roman Catholic Church that explains all the rest. So everything that's wrong with the Catholic Church is in Mariology, okay? And here it comes. The mother of God of Roman Catholic Marian dogma is quite simply the principle, type, and essence of the human creature cooperating servant-like in its own redemption on the basis of prevenient grace. And to that extent, the principle, type, and essence of the church. So it's not only Mary, it starts with Mary, but then it's every, it's the whole church's problem. We, it, yeah. So he explains this heresy as the belief that the human creature, and I'm quoting again here, possesses a relatively independent place and function in the redemptive process, wherein the creature not only needs Christ, but in all seriousness, he says, Christ also needs it. So he's right. That's exactly what the principle of Mary's mediation upholds for Catholics, um, that we are truly free before God, that we have our own will, our own freedom before him, and have an essential role, therefore, in our own redemption, but also the redemption of others. Mary, as a human creature, not only needs God in order to exist, A, and then B, to receive grace, but God, in a certain sense, depends on Mary to say yes at the Annunciation to his calling to be Christ's mother in order for Christ to become flesh. So in rejecting the idea of Mary's mediation, Karl Barth is rightly concerned that if we affirm Mary's role in freedom before God, we, we're going to take away from God in some way and the gratuity of grace. So that's what he's concerned about. He's also afraid that if we affirm Mary's mediation, we are saying that Christ is somehow insufficient for our own salvation, that we need two mediators. Um, but in this, in rejecting Mary's mediation, what Bart is struggling with is the question of what is the role of human freedom before God? Does it actually exist before God? Because without this title, or not this title, but this um, understanding, it leads either to predestination, where no one really has freedom, right? Or a coerced yes, that Mary has to say yes to God at the Annunciation in order to become the mother of God. Um, but if salvation is ordered to love, freedom is required. Um, love is never something you can coerce from someone. In fact, that's the very opposite of what love is. Love has to be free. So with Bart, a Catholic absolutely wants to affirm the priority and transcendence of God. But we can affirm that without denying human freedom. It's not an either or. Either we're free and, or not. It's both and for us. You can have both. Catholics don't see God's dependence on the human person's response, so God's dependence on Mary's yes, um, as a threat to God is, but instead reveals who God is, which is love, that he desires the free response of us to give ourselves to him in return. So this is the principle that Mary's mediation upholds, that we are free in our relationship with God, that we participate in that relationship, and not only in that relationship, but in the very communion of persons that is God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now we're just going to do this briefest of trace of the tradition of how we have understood Mary's mediation, just to kind of see how we got to the place where we are today. So we'll start with the patristic era. The church fathers had a twofold understanding of Mary's mediation. First, they said Mary mediates Christ to us by being the mother of God, which is to take it at its most literal level, right? 
Um, Mary brings Christ to us because she nurtures him in her womb, she gives birth to him, and she cares for him throughout his life. And this literal and historical dimension of Mary's mediation has a spiritual dimension as well. We are creatures of body and soul. So because she is mother of God, she is also mother of the Christian, because we are all brothers and sisters in Christ. The patristics express this spiritual dimension primarily through Mary's intercession for Christians, particularly those in um, great danger. In fact, the first use of the word mediatrix in the tradition is in this legend where someone sold his soul to the devil, and they appeal to Mary's intercession um, to free them from the bonds um, of that. And so that's when the first instance of her being called mediatrix is. It became a pious practice of Christians of appealing to her intercession um, at that time. So for the patristics, Mary's faith undergirds their understanding of her mediation. So that's really what the priority is. Mary is the mother of God because she consents in faith to God's plan of becoming flesh in Christ. Um, Mary intercedes for us through a faith-filled prayer to God. What is intercession if not prayer? And what is prayer if not an act of faith in God? So the patristics approach Mary's mediation from the ground, as it were. So I think we should pause here too and explain what we mean by mediation because it's something we can say a lot, but we don't always know what it means. So. Most literally, it comes from the Greek word mestesis, and it was understood as someone who brings together two parties, who reconciles two adverse parties, or who's an arbiter or medium of communication between two. So it's someone who stands in the middle. And when this is taken into the Latin, it's defined as being in the middle, intervening, coming between. So in terms of Mariology, this idea is first expressed in St. Irenaeus, um, who calls Mary the advocate of, of Eve. So she stands between Eve and God, advocating for Eve's forgiveness, Eve's salvation, um, whatever. So the fathers could speak of salvation, opening up creation's freedom and its openness to God through the doctrine of creation, the resurrection, and the incarnation. But we can perhaps say this understanding of mediation as simply a middleman between two um, is a bit underdeveloped. They're not thinking in terms of the personal dimension of what mediation is. So what does it mean for Mary as a person to mediate, to be mother? Um, so that's why the following periods in church history, from the medievals to the nominalists to, to today, are trying to develop what we mean by saying Mary mediates. They're drawing further what's already there in the patristics, and there's a lot there in the patristics. So the medieval period, which is known as the golden age of Mariology, affirms this patristic understanding of Mary's mediation, but they approach it from a different perspective. Um, so whereas the patristics approached it from the historical kind of ground level, the medievals are gonna focus more on Mary's presence beneath the cross and her suffering with Christ. Um, but also on her current role in heaven of dispensing the graces of redemption to humanity. So really what they're trying to look at is her personhood in heaven, where she currently is. So this perspective articulates the same mystery that the patristics spoke of, but with an eschatological emphasis. So how this role plays out now as mother in heaven. We see in this period, for example, St. Bernard of Clairvaux's image of Mary as the aqueduct, which is perhaps the most common um, and popular kind of understanding and image of what Mary's mediation is. But the medieval approach leaves the question of her human personhood underdeveloped. Isn't there more to nature or to Mary's role in human history than this? So then when the nominalist movement arises, it's trying to give more integrity to human nature's freedom by emphasizing the importance of human freedom of human action, right? The problem, though, with nominalism, and we could say a lot more about it, but we're just going to not, is that it understands human nature apart from its givenness and creation. So it understands human nature very abstractly. What do we, I mean by this? It means that God's action in the world, and human action as well, is understood as sheer volition, sheer will. Like, as we would say today, power. Um, like, kind of this infinite power, this infinite desire to exercise what I want. Um, but 
if God and man are understood as this pure will, then the action of both God and man are either going to run parallel to each other, kind of never meet, they're on two different planes, or they're going to crash into each other. Um, if we think about it, if we're all just will, that's what everyone else is too. You are just going to want to exercise your power, your will. Everyone else is doing that too. You're going to run up against someone else. It's inherently conflicting. So if we think about Mary's mediating role in Christianity within the school of thoughts, emphasis on will, to say that Mary's role in Christianity, or that she has this mediating role, it would put her in competition with God's saving work, like if you follow the logic of that. So while the nominalists are trying to affirm, affirm the importance of her freedom, there, the consequent understanding of mediation from there is not actually true to the tradition of the church in this regard. But even so, it's a very widely influential, if not misguided, school of thought in the church. So by the time we get to the reformers in the Protestant Reformation, they reject her mediation because the kind of mediation that nominalism would propose and give a human being is positivistic. It means it just emphasizes Mary's power, her volition, without any nuance of relationality, receptivity, participation. So the reformers rightly say this would make God dependent on humanity and create two sources of redemption. And so they reject it. That's not, I mean, if that's what you think is the understanding of mediation, of course you would reject that, 100%. So in response to this rejection of Mary's mediation, the typical Catholic response in the centuries is to try to give more legitimacy to her mediation. The problem, however, is that they unknowingly inherited this nominalistic understanding of mediation. So it was a very kind of functional understanding, or as you know, in the terms we're putting it here tonight, a nominalistic one. Um, and they did so by unconsciously adopting a language of power to try to articulate it. For example, um, we see in this period Saint Louis de Montfort, who's a great guy. He's a saint, <laughs> great guy, <laughs> right? Um, <laughs> And um, he's very popular among Marian devotees, and his um, true devotion to Mary is hugely important for many um, people who have a Marian devotion, but also St. John Paul II, who said the book changed his life. And in the true devotion to Mary, he proposes a spirituality of Marian consecration, which is really just about giving ourselves to Mary and allowing her to teach us how to give ourselves in faith to God, to really kind of allow her as a mother teach us and mold in us the capacity to say yes to God, to enter into her obedient spirit um, and spirit of faith to make room for Christ in us. So he's trying to show that her yes to God is one of obedience and service. So that's great. It's 100% true. It's not about power or competition. But however, the lang if you've read True Devotion to Mary, and some people it's their jam, you know, one of my best friends, she loves True Devotion to Mary, and that's just, and I agree with the point he's saying, but it's not my jam, it's fine. Um, but he t the language he uses almost undermines his point. Um, he talks about how we are to be slaves of Mary, for example. And I think as a modern audience, we're very sensitive to any language of slavery or power or oppression or things like that, right? It doesn't exactly evoke great, happy feelings, right? Um, so he talks about being her slaves, which says we are in, she's the one with the power over us, right? And he emphasizes her importance so much that she almost seems to be a super divine figure. She's not for him, but kind of the superfluous, um, not superfluous, but like the flowery Baroque language can lead itself to interpreting it that way. De Montfort's movement is carried forward into the 20th century in what is now known as the, media, the Mediatrics Movement, which I never knew this existed until like a couple years ago and I was a Catholic all my life, but there was a movement in the 20th century that sought that petitioned the Holy Father for decades to define Mary as mediatrix of all graces. Um, it occurred after the um, dogma, dogmatic definition of Mary's Immaculate Conception. And um, it's interesting, though, because Mary's mediation has been with the church since the earliest centuries, and you could argue that there's more basis for it in the tradition than the Immaculate Conception. So why did several Holy Fathers and even the Second Vatican Council not touch it? They, it was just kind of always met with silence. There was a lot of popular movement and fervor behind it, but in the end, there was no dogma declared. Why? 
there's a lot of reasons for it. And one of the reasons isn't that, you know, we're more enlightened Catholics now and that kind of devotion is a thing of the past, that it's not important or that it's superfluous to our faith. It's more that the mediatrics movement didn't really have a coherent or um, unified understanding of what mediation meant or what even grace meant. Um, if you go through, they tried to press them on that and everyone kind of had a different answer of what this meant. And also, its motivation wasn't quite coherent. Why, why should this be declared dogma? Well, a lot of them said well, it would add another jewel to Mary's crown, and then we'd receive more graces. Okay, so while you know the desire to affirm Mary's importance to the faith is great, and that's their primary motivation, um, it's not transactional, right? I mean, the point shouldn't be, let's get, give Mary this name so we can get more graces. It's very functional and transactional, right? They are unconsciously operating within a paradigm of mediation as power. They emphasize Mary's powerful action as a function she performs that has good effects for us, right? So this doesn't fully illustrate what mediation is in our tradition. So the silence of the Holy Fathers and the Second Vatican Council here um, is actually a very prudent move. It's as if to say the language being used is not yet there yet. It's not ripe. So there's some, we're not quite getting at what the mystery is. So then two decades later, St. John Paul II becomes Pope, and he, I think, um, provides us the beginning of a framework to understand what mediation is. So when St. John Paul II became Pope in 1978, he brought to the church a personalistic framework in which to approach our faith. Now by personalism, you know, he, he lived in the 20th century and through the Second World War that saw the total destruction and violence against the human person. And he became, he was a philosopher, actually an actor, and then a philosopher before he was, um, I think even a seminarian. And then when he was first a priest, he was a philosophy professor he became very concerned with the movement called personalism, which is what does it mean to be a human person? Um, so it means to emphasize the human person and all of his or her dimensions, so as body, soul, psychologically, um, spiritually, etc., but also the personhood of God and what relationship means. So his contribution to the church in this regard is immeasurable. And in regards to Mariology in particular, his emphasis on her personhood really helps us see with new eyes what is her mediation. And it's also interesting because if ever there was a super Mary Pope, it was St. John Paul II. He, um, his apostolic motto was taken from St. Louis de Montfort's true devotion to Mary, totus tuus, totally yours, um, which I think reveals the central importance of Marian's consecration to his spirit, not only to his own private spirituality, but to his apostolic work as well. Um, he devoted an entire encyclical to Mary called um, Mother of the Redeemer. He mentioned Mary in literally, and I know because I had to work on a JP2 translation project, literally in everything, every speech, every prayer, everything, there's always a little part about Mary in it. Um, he added five new mysteries to the rosary, the luminous mysteries. He survived an assassination attempt, incidentally on the Feast of Our Lady of Fatima, which, fun fact, um, he was on his way to announce the beginnings of the JP2 Institute in Rome, in St. Peter's Square, and then he was unfortunately shot. But he credited his survival, his miraculous survival, really, to Mary's intercession. And what's interesting is that he didn't see the need to dogmatically define Mary's mediation, or, as, or Mary's mediatrics of all graces. In fact, he rarely used the title mediatrics. He does on occasion, but never in like a super you know, like obvious or official capacity. Um, so in his Marian encyclical, when he talks about Mary's mediation, he says we might call her mediatrix, he's quoting the Second Vatican Council, but he calls it her maternal mediation, and he's describing what it is as maternal mediation over and over and over again. So he's seeing something about maternal that kind of evokes more deeply for us to help us enter into the mystery of her mediation anew. So to understand what he means by maternal mediation, we're going to break apart the two words, maternal and mediation, to get at it. But we're going to start with mediation. I know it's backwards, but we're going to start with mediation because it'll help. So John Paul II's starting point for mediation, as it should be everyone's, is Christ 
who is the one mediator between God and man, hands down. And he, the foundation of this is in Christ's hypostatic union, which is theology talk for the union of human nature and divine nature in his flesh. So in Christ's very person, in his very being, human nature and divine, humanity and God are irrevocably united in communion forever. Like, full stop. So he's literally bringing the two into unity. So this union takes place not only at the level of his flesh and existence, but also it, he carries it out in his historical mission, which culminates in the cross, where he redeems fallen, sinful humanity and brings it into communion with God, at, at, at an utterly new communion with God. So John Paul II draws out this inherent communal dimension of Christ's mediation by emphasizing the gift character of Christ's action, of his being and his redeeming work. Christ, he says, has given himself to humanity, and he constantly gives himself to the Father. Now, because the very content, I guess you could say, of Christ's mediation is this self-gift to the Father and to humanity, it's inherently generous and um, focused on the other. So it makes space for the gift of the other to respond to his gift. Because of this, his mediation isn't exclusive or closed off. It's open for others to participate in. So Mary's mediation is what he calls a mediation in Christ. So it's nothing more than just her entering into Christ's one mediation. Christ's mediation is open to otherness, which not only allows Mary to be within his mediation, but it also means she can make his mediation present to others in a very real way. Another way John Paul II speaks my son is probably so excited. <laughs> the choose. Um, so another way John Paul II speaks of Mary's mediation is through the idea of presence. When we give of ourselves to another, and we think about this, we're truly present with them. Present to them and with them. Presence is a being with someone. It's a personalistic understanding of mediation. To mediate for John Paul II is also, he uses the words a lot, to make present. This isn't really novel. The very name Jesus, who is the one mediator, Emmanuel is God is with us. So presence is, so he's actually present with us. So presence is a very like kind of more concrete way of trying to understand what's going on with mediation. So to say, for example, that Mary mediates is to say that she makes herself and God present to us and her gift of self to us. So in her motherly gift of self, she mysteriously makes God present to us and brings us into deeper communion with him. Now, before anyone gets alarmed or thinks that's really weird or crosses a line, let's think about it together and we'll see this is actually quite natural and ordinary and we see it every day. Before he became Pope, and I mentioned he was an actor, he also was a, I almost said try to be a playwright, he was a playwright, but his plays, I don't know if you've ever read them, but they're really abstract and um, cerebral. They're not like going to the theater and enjoying like a nice Shakespearean play or something. It's like, you need to read this with your philosophy glasses on to like really into, he's trying to get into the depths of human experience. So there's a lot of long monologues. Anyway, there's a really good one, although yeah, it's, it's, it's intense called The Radiation of Fatherhood. And in it, the play follows the character Adam, who's this everyman. He, re he represents all of fallen humanity, more or less. And he's struggling with the question of um, the call to become a father. Um, because it involves a sacrifice on his part, it involves him to die to himself. And because he's fallen and sinful, he doesn't like that idea because he's afraid it means he will be annihilated. There will be nothing left of me if I give myself away, if I, you know, to die, you know. Um, so in his fatherhood of his daughter, Monica, so he does have a daughter. It's very confusing because he's rejecting being a father, but he has a daughter. That's a JP2 play for you. Okay. Um, but he's called to radiate God's fatherhood. And what is radiation? I had a friend who studied physics at one point and before he became a priest, but he explained radiation, it's actually like a physical image of what mediation is, that think the sun radiates, the earth absorbs the 
and I, if anyone's a physicist and knows how to, if I'm saying this wrong, but this is essentially what he said, that the earth absorbs the radiation of the sun, but emanates it in return. So even radiation is a way to kind of understand what he means by mediation. But he's called to radiate this fatherhood of God to his daughter. He's to make God's fatherhood and love present to his daughter, but precisely through his particular love for her. So John Paul II proposes an image to help us understand this. He talks about this river that's running through the mountains. The river has a source. In fact, the river's source, so the source of the water and the river, it constitutes the river. You can't have a river without a water source. When we wet our feet in the river, we are encountering the river itself, but we are also encountering the source of the river, which is something we don't see. But it's somehow mysteriously present and actually present in the, wa in the river of the running water. So through the embrace of the river, the source of the water of the river embraces us too. And that's what Monica says to her father as she's calling him to please love me, essentially like, through your love for me, the source of your love, God, embraces me too. So this is because the source of Adam's love is not himself. The source is God. God is the, we are the river, more or less, but God is the source. He's the source of all love and all giving. He's first given himself to us, and when Adam receives that love, <laughs> um, he, um, has, yeah, he has to die to himself, really, to empty himself to receive that love. And then he participates in that love as he gives himself away. So in Adam's love and his presence to his daughter, God's love and presence is also mysteriously present to her. So this is how John Paul II understands mediation, which is quite extraordinary, but it's also very inherent to the created order. How often true is it in our experience that um, our experience of our earthly fathers affects how we perceive and understand God's fatherhood of us. It's not simply psychology, it's because there's a mysterious kind of participation or imaging going on um, between human fatherhood and God's fatherhood. So when we speak of Mary's mediation, it's essentially this. God gives himself to Mary. She receives the gift of God's grace and gives herself entirely to him in return, which is, in essence, what faith is. And in doing so, she gives birth to Christ in the world. Or in other words, he, she makes him present to us. This happens in the incarnation, but also throughout history as she prays and intercedes for every member of the church. So in this way, she gives birth to Christ in us over and over and over again. Now, as we saw, mediation is essentially what happens when we participate in the communion that is God. Um, it's to participate in that love that is given to us with the corresponding gift of ourselves in return. So when John Paul II calls her mediation maternal, what does this add to it? So maternal is very significant for John Paul II, and I'm going to just kind of highlight four main ways how this affects how we are to understand Mary's mediation. First, um, in calling her mediation maternal, He's saying we have to understand it as literally maternal, like on the most basic level as possible. When we speak of the maternal nature of Mary's mediation, John Paul II is saying that we have to first and foremost understand her mediation within her motherhood of Jesus, as depicted in the Gospels. He helps us see that motherhood, as, a, as we understand it in the natural order, is inherently mediatory. It carries within itself this dynamic of giving, receiving, and fruitfulness, which is the same dynamic of communion. So in becoming a mother, a woman receives the gift of the bridegroom. She responds with a gift of herself in return, and their union results in an entirely new and unique person. So we have giving, receiving, fruitfulness, more or less. So in motherhood, we see the fruitfulness of communion between persons, of receiving love and giving it in return. The mother's love mysteriously makes a new person, the child, present in the world. If we look at this more concretely, say a pregnant woman, um, is she not making, in a mysterious way, another person present through her own body? Um, John Paul II describes the moment of the visitation when Mary visits her cousin Elizabeth while she's pregnant with Jesus, and Elizabeth is pregnant with St. John Paul, 
Saint John Paul II, <laughs> JK, <laughs> Saint John the Baptist. And he says, when the pregnant Mary greets her cousin Elizabeth, as scripture says, the infant in Saint Elizabeth's womb leaps with joy. So at the sound of Mary's voice, the infant in Elizabeth's womb, John the Baptist, recognize, recognizes Christ. He encounters Christ through Mary's body, through her voice. Um, he says it's like the first tabernacle in human history. Um, and she's making him present for others to encounter, even in her own flesh. And that pregnant body, it's really the sign of, I'm, you know, I, I'm not an individual standing on my own in the world. I'm, there's this other person who's always with me, even though, and even though it's veiled, right? So to understand Mary's mediation of right, John Paul II we, says we have to look at this in terms of motherhood on the natural level that we can all, we all have access to in one way or another. Second, to understand Mary's mediation as maternal for John Paul II means we have to understand it as faith. So as we know, Mary's motherhood of Jesus looks a little different than how most other motherhoods go because she's a virgin. Um, and she conceives Christ in her womb when she responds in faith to God. So she's mother because, first and foremost, she has faith in God. She receives, conceives Christ in her, womb, in her womb and when she responds in faith to God's plan. So John Paul II says that motherhood in the natural order, as we just described it, has a spiritual order and dimension to it too. In Christianity, some women are called to be physical mothers, and some are called to be spiritual mothers. And he teaches that Mary is the lucky one who unites both those orders in herself, and we all have glimpses of it. Um, physical mothers, we, there is a spiritual dimension to our motherhood. You're educating a child. For example, you're bringing them to the faith. Uh, for spiritual mothers, like religious sisters, um, there's a physical dimension to it, too. You're feeding the hungry, you know. Um, but one has priority over the other in, in the order as we know it now. But Mary united, she had both, like the great things of both of them, really. Um, spiritual motherhood, John Paul II teaches, has the same dynamic of natural motherhood. So the woman receives the gift of the bridegroom with the gift of herself in return, and that union between them is fruitful of new life. But in the order of the spirit, the gift of the bridegroom is God himself. The bride, in this case Mary, but really is every human creature in the church, um, receives the gift of God and to give ourselves in return and trusting ourselves entirely to him, that's made fruitful of new life, of Christ's life in the world. This is what faith is for John Paul II. It's not simply, you know, we think of faith as intellectual adherence to objective truth, which is 100% true, but it's within a relationship of receiving God's grace, of giving ourselves in return. It's a spousal gift of self that involves our entire self, but also an abandonment of oneself, a poverty of spirit. So this mystery is dramatized in Mary because she doesn't become fruitful, fruitful of a grace that's kind of intangible, but actual, like, literal grace, Jesus Christ, <laughs> who takes flesh. So this spiritual dimension of maternal demands that we approach Mary's mediation entirely in terms of faith. Her mediating action is never anything more than her act of faith in God. It's not something she exerts or demands or earns, but her act of faith is simply entrusting herself to the prior gift of God. So to bring this back to mediation, Mary mediates Christ to us in and only through her faith. So this is why we speak of Mary's mediation kind of on this side of the cross as intercession. And what is intercession if not prayer, where you entrust not only yourself, but the needs of others. You know, your friend asks you to pray for them. Well, you're not, you don't give them the miracle they need. You bring that petition and trust it to God to come for them. Um, so intercession, her interceding role is nothing more than an act of faith, a prayer in God, to God. So third, to understand Mary's mediation as maternal is, means we have to understand it only in terms of personal communion, so as something personal and something relational. John Paul II says, and I'm quoting here, that of the essence of motherhood is the fact that it concerns the person, 
Motherhood always establishes a unique and unrepeatable relationship between two people, between mother and child, and between child and mother. And this relationship between mother and child is constituted by self-giving love, openness, generosity, service, and communion. So to say her mediation is maternal is to say we have to always understand it in terms of relationship, of relationality, of um, sacrifice, um, of givenness, of, in, of infinite generosity, and attentiveness to the human person. So this maternal dimension highlights what's always been true about mediation um, as a mystery of communion and presence, but it does so in a way that is accessible to us because most of us, if, if you don't have you know a mother that's been with you all your life you have an idea of what that is or you've had a mother for you in another capacity too um so it means we can never understand mediation in terms of power or transaction if you don't have a great mother if she's like looking at you in terms of like she's trying to exert power or coercion over you right that's actually like the antithesis of what true motherhood is so power and transaction competition is antithetical to love which is why maternal helps us see mediation as always relational. And finally, to understand medi her mediation as maternal means um, it has a prophetic, and I'm quoting, he calls it a prophetic meaning. What does he mean by prophetic? He means that within the feminine person, the female person, and its ordination to motherhood, we see illustrated in a totally unique and dramatic way what it means to be a human person, whether you're male or female. As human creatures, we depend entirely on God for our existence, but also for the gift of his grace. So we are therefore primarily receptive in nature, first and foremost. Um, we're ordered to receive the gift of God and to give ourselves in return. So this mutual giving and receiving between God is always fruitful. Um, in a way that's both totally miraculous and unmerited and unattainable by ourselves, but also quite natural and ordinary that we see every day. This is why scripture and the church, or the tradition, speak of the church as the bride. Um, this bridal dimension of the church applies to both men and women. This is why John Paul II says St. Saint Saint Paul uses the image of a woman in labor to describe his own mission. He says, my little children with whom I am in travail. The very nature of woman, for John Paul II, reveals and prophesies this truth of being a human being in a very tangible, natural, and accessible way. When he says this, he's not erasing sexual difference by saying men and women are exactly the same, but he's also not saying that women are dependent and men are independent. He's saying that women just reveal, in a particular way, the most essential truth of what it means to be human. And that is to receive the gift of God, to give ourselves in return, and bear fruit in the world. So this fourth um, prophetic dimension that maternal brings is to say that Mary's mediating role to every Christian reveals to all of us how we are to bring Christ to the world and to live out our calling, our vocation in fullness. We are to receive the gift of God, give ourselves entirely to him, and participate in the communion that God is. So to be in communion with God is to live in communion with everyone who is in God. So that means within our gift of self, whether immediately to God or indirectly to God through other people, we realize the fullness of our Christian vocation. In giving ourselves away, we are making space for Christ to literally be present in us and in the world among us. In this way, we are all called to mediate Christ to the world. Mary just happens to reveal this truth most perfectly and most dramatically. So to draw these four dimensions of maternal to a close, we can say when John Paul II says maternal mediation, he's talking about how she makes Christ present to us through her own act of faith, which is at the same time her gift of self to God and to all humanity. In her loving gift of self, she becomes the point of encounter between God and humanity as she makes Christ present to us as a mother. And this not only illustrates what it means to be a human being, because we are all made for in communion and for communion, but also what is most essential to our Christian vocation. It's not necessarily you have to do X, Y, and Z, make this many converts or whatever. It's we are to make Christ present in the world through our faith, through our gift of self and participation in his life. <clears throat> 
So I would say in this way, John Paul II really allows us to see what her mediation is with new eyes as something that reveals you know, who we are and what constitutes our vocation. Thank you.